Funding for Curate, the Arizona Arts and Culture Fund is made possible by Signal Society member Eleanor Light and by You Can Become a Curator of the Arts on 8. For more information, call 602-496-8888. And now, an 8th special presentation. This time on Art Beat Nation. An exhibit celebrates the mind behind the iconic Peanuts comic strip. He, he documented an era through a cartoon strip. We look back at a legendary painter and his timeless works capturing nature's splendor. He was like any young enthusiastic artist who was aspiring to change the world. Actor Zach Braff speaks frankly about what inspired his latest project. And we took a lot of stories and anecdotes from our own childhood and kind of wove it together with fiction. And an artist turns trash into high design. These people that are represented through mannequins are literally surrounded by the things that they consume. It's all ahead on this edition of Art Beat Nation. Funding for Art Beat Nation is made possible by donations to Curate, the Arizona PBS Arts and Culture Fund, and by contributions to eight from viewers like you. Thank you. First up, we head down to Hollywood, Florida, where the genius behind the Peanuts comic strip gets a proper tribute. From original sketchings to a life-size Snoopy doghouse, this exhibition is both fun and educational for visitors of all ages. We're a visual and performing arts center, and this particular building is this is where we house our visual art exhibitions for both adults as well as children. We've been in this building since 1990. We moved here with the intent of it becoming the Art and Culture Center, and in 1992 we reopened, and here we are, still here today. Our curator, who's so motivated and, and is such initiative, will have 15 to 16 different art exhibitions a year. So there's always something new for that person to come here and see. Our latest exhibit, Charles M. Schultz, Pop Culture and Peanuts, it is a tremendous exhibition that includes 70 original drawings by Charles M. Schultz that span his 50-year career of drawing peanuts every day throughout those 50 years. And combined with that is a selection of pop culture memorabilia and peanuts memorabilia spanning also those 50 years. And so we have lots of fun things that Schultz referred to in his strips over the years that are kind of pop culture elements, such as trampoline or uh, skateboarding and, and surfing and so forth. It was a wonderful surprise to see that this exhibition is so much more than, than comic strips. It has all this wonderful memorabilia that makes you realize the importance of Charles Schultz's work. He, he documented an era through a cartoon strip. We also have summer camps. We offer programming from ages six, so there is no age limit, but we bring in a lot of field trips here to the galleries during the summer, as well as we then conduct our own summer arts programming ourselves. We made yeah. insects out of paper mache. It was really fun. Yeah, it was really fun. I love drawing. We definitely set up some places within the show that kids and grown-ups can interact and have fun. We had a life-size Snoopy doghouse built by Hollywood Woodworking, and they did a spectacular job of building our Snoopy doghouse. And kids and adults are welcome to draw the curtain that's there, and they can look inside and see what Snoopy has. Oh, my favorite part is peeking into Snoopy's doghouse and seeing what's in there. <laughs> my husband is a woodworker, and he was invited to build the doghouse, so that was really great. 
There was a lot of discussion as to how it was going to be constructed and that, in fact, my husband went out and bought old boards because he didn't want to be using brand new wood. I wasn't surprised that this show came here because this, the Art and Culture Centre puts on such great quality exhibitions. We now walk through the Rorick Museum in New York City, where hundreds of paintings by Russian artist Nicholas Rorick adorn the walls. The so-called Master of Mountains, active in the first half of the 20th century, journeyed all over the world to study nature. Join us at this retrospective to see the splendor Rorick captured on canvas. Welcome to Nicholas Rorick Museum. My name is Guido Trepsa. I am curator of the museum. It's a one artist museum. The Russian painter Nicholas Rorik, who lived from 1874 to 1947, it's a so-called French style of displaying uh, the paintings. They are all over the walls and it's kind of home atmosphere. You are welcome to roam about and uh, just enjoy them. We have about 200 of them, and mostly his Himalaya period. So there are lots of mountains, lots of blues, lots of whites, and as some say, there is a really heavenly atmosphere. He was born in St. Petersburg in 1874 in quite a well-to-do family, and the family wanted him to pursue law, so he made a compromise and he enrolled into a department of law in the university and uh, then he was allowed to pursue his artistic interests and he also studied in the Imperial Academy of Arts which he graduated in 1897. He was like any young enthusiastic artist who was aspiring to change the world and he tried to find his style and his place. And uh, interestingly enough, he never lost that uh, aspiration. We have just three pieces from his Russian period, which ended in 1916. And uh, one of them is a lovely uh, little sketch from 1903, which uh, shows us his loose brushwork and compressed composition and uh, focus on physical nature of paint. Another painting which we have, which probably is the most famous painting of that period, it's called Last Angel. It was painted in 1912, two years before World War I started. As critics all agree, it's quite prophetic because it kind of predicts that terrible tragedy that came to Europe there is this hint about destruction of cities and uh, tragedy. It was his lifelong dream to go to India, and at last he came to India in 1924. He went to this extraordinary expedition at that time with his wife Helen and with his son George, and he fell in love with mountains and during the first eight months of 1924, he stayed in Danchili, which is uh, in foothills of Himalaya. And he uh, painted about 80 canvases, changed his style completely. We can almost say that he was completely reborn as an artist. He developed a completely different palette of colors. My favorite painting over these years it's actually a small piece, it's 12 by 16 inches. Like everything else in nature, mountains contain this primeval life force and uh, contain these hints to deeper layers of reality. You know, if you go to Himalaya and if you stand before them, then the dominant feeling is just an awe. You're completely overtaken with something that is at the same time terrific and utterly beautiful. But the point is that it's much, much bigger than you. He truly loved mountains and continued to paint them until the end of his life. And he was even called the master of the mountains. 
There is a part of his life in which he was a mystic. Lots of paintings are influenced by his philosophy or his spiritual beliefs. He was very well versed in the world's mythologies and religions. He loved to point out whenever he could that his works actually should have two names or two authors or two painters, him and his wife, because his wife was more often than not an inspiration behind the painting. And there are quite a number of paintings which were painted uh, according to her visions. So she just described to him what to paint and uh, he did it like the mother of the world, which is by far the most uh, popular painting among the visitors. After they reached India, he produced one of his maybe most famous paintings. He called it Krishna. When you see this painting, just imagine that he has survived this incredibly hard journey of five years long, and there was lots of misery, lots of deprivation, lots of hardship, death, and tragedy. And there is nothing of that in his painting. To me, it is Rorick's equivalent to Beethoven's Ode to Joy. That is a real hymn to nature at that moment in the spring when everything awakens and emerges from winter slumber and starts to live again. And in a sense, that maybe is his main message, that just to live is enough. That is enough for feeling joyful and happy and for being here. Thank you for listening to all this and you are welcome to come to us and we'll be glad to answer your questions and tell you more about Nikola Sorek and his work. For more information, please visit Rorik.org. In our next segment, reporter Jared Bowen sits down with actor and director of Scrubs fame, Zach Braff. Join us now as Braff discusses the inspiration behind his latest labor of love, the crowdfunded film, Wish I Was Here. Okay, attendance. Grace. Here. Tucker. Here. What's your name? Anthony. Anthony's here too, Dad. All right, Anthony, welcome to our classroom. Now, kids, Unless you're on the Autobahn, you're never gonna get a car like this up to speed. So in a city like LA, it's really about what it sounds like when you floor it from a full stop. Yes, but kids, we're on Robertson Boulevard, so there will be no flooring it from a full stop. Will there be? No, sir. Thank you. <laughs> So Zach Braff, your your last movie looked at uh, your, sort of your place in family, and, and this film also looks at your place in family, but also your father's mortality. And there was a lot of conversation about generations and your ties to the story. So how autobiographical is this story? Well, I wrote it with my brother Adam, and it really is inspired by our family in lots of ways. It's about brothers and a father, um, and 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 we took a lot of stories and anecdotes from our own childhood and kind of wove it together with fiction. Um, um, in the film, the father's very against the, the son being, trying to be an, an actor. My father's my biggest champion and supporter, um, for example. Um, but, um, but we wanted to write about, you know, you know father-son relationships. Is this, I know that you know, there are only threads to what you've experienced, but is it a process by which you and your brother can, can process things and, and sort of digest experiences that you've had just by writing something like this? Sure, well, I think first and foremost, the terror of losing our, our father. I mean, that's, you know, I think it was almost a, not that it was cathartic in any way, but it was something, it's, it's clearly any, any therapist would say we're dealing with our own fears of mortality and, and losing a parent. I mean, I'm 39 and my brother's 49. So, um, you know, when you're, when you're in, in, in our age range, you start to think about, oh my God, I'm not gonna have my parents forever. And, 
and then I, what do I believe about mortality and spirituality? And, and my brother has two young kids, so he's like, what do I teach my kids? I don't even know what I believe yet. What, what am I going to teach my kids? And so um, I, I think that was a way for us to sort of start a conversation with each other and then eventually our father because, uh, because you know, he saw it and, and it, it sparked great conversation. Part of what is so endearing about this film is the relationship your character has with his children. You're not a dad yet. No. Uh, is, so how did, you, how did you arrive at who he would be as a father? Well, my brother is a really funny dad. He kind of just talks to his kids like they're his peers sometimes, and that always made me laugh. Um, you know, they frustrated me like, oh, come on, man, what are you doing? Like, and and that, that just always cracked me up, the, the kind of dad who, uh, who's kind of talking to his kids like they're his buddies. And, you know, a guy who, who isn't, you know, who's, who's his own out-of-the-box kind of dad. And that, that's definitely what interested me. And for me, playing the role, I, you know, he's supposed to be a guy, a dad who's a little checked out and, and figures out a way to connect to his kids. In terms of the, just the, the, the filmmaking here, you had to do a Kickstarter campaign yeah. in order to have the freedoms that you wanted as a filmmaker. Is that the new structure for filmmaking, do you think? Is that the only way to have this sort of liberty? No, I don't think. It was an experiment. I mean, that's what it was. It was like, you know, we were just tired of banging our heads against the wall. So we thought, well, what if this crazy experiment would work? We never imagined it would work in 48 hours. We, we thought we had a month. Um, so that became a whole new conversation. But no, I, I don't plan to go crowdfund all my films. It was just a, sort of a, wouldn't this be um, a wonderful experiment? And um, I don't think a lot of people who, are, who love movies but are fully savvy really understand that. So for me, telling a story about my, my family and my, something that was going to be a little different and, and, and um, definitely was imperative that, that I have the final say and not um, a bank. And it would seem that it does work more because it was an organic process in the way that you all came together. Even, I think, some of your own clothes you used, you, you shot some of it in your own home. Oh, yeah, everything. Well, when you, when you make a movie on a, a, on a lower budget, I, I, almost every piece of wardrobe is mine. Um, Kate wore a lot of her own clothes. Uh, um, the little boy stayed in my house because um, he lives in Atlanta. Um, yeah, we, we all, everyone, everyone made it happen. All right, well, Zach Braff, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Artist Charlotte Crook adds her own spin on eye candy by using recognizable wrappers from candy, coffee, toothpaste, and more to create couture clothing that reflects our material culture. This project and my own artwork is, it's very personal. And a lot of it is looking at myself as a consumer and looking at my own sins and forcing myself to save every package that I consume uh, in knowing that, hey, I'm gonna, I'm gonna share that with the world. My name is Charlotte Crook and I am an artist and high school sculpture arts teacher. We were on a family vacation trip and I had eaten now and laters and there was no garbage can in sight. And uh, you know, what do you do? You, you carry these all day? And I started to think about this packaging, which I was working with. And then I started to, in my mind, see them as textiles and see sewing them back together and becoming this original sheet that they had been cut out of to become just the little individual candy wrappers. All of the effort and engineering that goes into brands and making the product and keeping the product sanitary, you know, for consumers, and then it's just waste. And so we produce so much waste on this planet. And I just thought, you know, okay, I'm going to hold on to these wrappers because look at what my brain is doing with putting them back together. And I sewed my first wearable sculpture at that point. It's been a tough learning curve to get to making these wearable sculptures. The title of this exhibition at the Racine Art Museum is Consumer Couture, The Politics of Having. It's a way for us as consumers to look at how we consume. So the politics of having is about needing and wanting and having, and at what point we make choices as consumers. 
Originally, all of my materials, I was the sole collector. So every candy wrapper, every candy bar, every candy that I consumed, I saved. And, you know, likewise with all of the toothpaste tubes, that's me, that's brushing my teeth. And so the collections take a long time to evolve and it takes a long time to collect enough materials to actually make something wearable. For Scene Art Museum, we're very focused on the handcrafted and our windows on Fifth Gallery. And the artist is given the opportunity to install work for a year. They have a lot of challenges. It's 90 feet long and three feet wide. They have to hang things. They can't put things on the window. So it's a really nice way to see artists sort of expand their thought process about their own work. What I've done is tried to fill each of those windows with a little vignette or a little story. Part of my concept is this idea of consumption and how everything starts out very sort of organized and it's all, it's all, you know, almost no big deal that I went and had a cup of coffee, but then when it starts to be the consumption and the overconsumption and, and it starts to fall into chaos. One of the windows is called Baggage. I've taken old Samsonite luggage and I've reinvented it or repurposed it, covering it with Dum Dum candy packaging and then made these fantastically oversized luggage tags, which are the seven deadly sins. And they're living in the window with Mr. Goodbar. He is experiencing life with the flavors of the month. And the flavors of the month are the 12 Barbies that are clothed in dresses that are made out of dumb dumb packaging. So the concept of luggage as baggage was the bigger idea that was that was happening there. The middle window is a wearable sculpture that I made quite a few years ago, and it's made out of 31 flavors, Baskin Robbins, ice cream taster spoons, and I've drilled holes in them like a button and then stitched each of them onto this dress, and the dress itself is actually made out of recycled piano bags. And then within that scene is 365 silver-plated spoons that have been drilled and hung on monofilament to look like this giant kind of like sunburst moving out away from her body and so this idea of our plastic culture versus this kind of like old world money culture in our modern society we can sort of pretend to be whoever we are the Chewy Fruit Twins are two wearable sculptures that look very similar. One is made from Starburst packaging and the other is made from Now and Later packaging. And they're intended to look like twins. And if you're a candy consumer, you know that both of those candies are fairly similar. There's a little girl mannequin that looks up at the two wearable sculptures and to her, in this scenario, they look like pinatas. Behind her, they're sort of like party banners, but they're cut with old English lettering, 14 virtues. And the concept of the child being fed these words of wisdom, and so will Tallulah, who's wearing, you know, a Hello Kitty coloring book dress with a giant Crayola crayon bow. Will she, in fact, take a virtuous path? Will she break the pinata and find treasure, or will she break the pinata and find chaos? We dress in a way that sort of reflects who we are, and these figures, so to speak, these people that are represented through mannequins are literally surrounded by the things that they consume. And I think that that is really important in a very capitalist culture. This would appeal to people because it's a way for her to sort of address larger, almost more global issues, but on a scale that's actually literally a human scale through the garments. There's a humor in it and a kind of extravagance in a certain way, but also I think it's a nice vehicle for her to address bigger issues. To some degree, it's fun to see other people's response to the work in hopes that people kind of take witness to, hey, that is trash that she's working with and look at how she's changed it and hopefully made me think about it in a different way and think about how I am consuming on this planet. For more arts and culture, visit azpbs.org slash artbeat, where you'll find feature videos and information on the Arizona art scene. Funding for Artbeat Nation is made possible by donations to Curate, the Arizona PBS Arts and Culture Fund, and by contributions to eight from viewers like you. Thank you.
Funding for Curate, the Arizona Arts and Culture Fund is made possible by Signal Society member Eleanor Light and by You Can Become a Curator of the Arts on 8. For more information, call 602-496-8888.